I was hoping you would tell everybody that I've been working on this for 30 years because well, the joke was going to be I must have started when I was two, right? Because <laughs> I look so young, not really. And actually, I was thinking about that between um, I'm going to introduce Jim Uphoff, who is kind of the, the brainchild behind this, this whole project. Started at what, 30? maybe 30 years ago, started looking at some of these linkages that we've formalized more today with some of the, um, the more recent work we've been doing. But between Jim and I, we probably should be dead when we um, look at our collective years of experience. <laughs> so um, anyway, with that, that um, introduction, I'll go ahead and, and say thanks again. Um, you know, it's been a privilege for me to be able to participate and work in this, in, work with this kind of um, science and the, doing these studies, even though we're a state agency, we're quasi, we're quasi science, I guess. Um, but it's been a privilege because um, over my, in my tenure at, at, with DNR, I've been able to dabble in different habitat types. But the last 15 years, um, when we formed a fisheries, fish habitat and ecosystem program, we really began to focus on tidal fisheries and how landscape changes are affecting tidal habitat and tidal fisheries. So um, that's going to be my focus today. Um, I'm going to give you a quick overview of just a couple of things that we do, kind of give you some, um, show you a couple of slides that where I'll pull some talking points and then talk about how that, how we're using that to translate into come kind of um, management guidance for fisheries, but also for landscape planners and, um, and local community groups, citizens, anybody who's interested in, in knowing a little more. So let me orient first. Is this the, that's the pointer? Okay. So um, as you all know, I'm shifting gears. You all, we've looked at, um, we've looked at SAV. We've looked at some of the in-water features, SAV shorelines and everything. And um, what we're doing is kind of looking now up at the at the landscape and specifically urbanization and how that is affecting and influencing aquatic habitats, um, particularly the downstream tidal fisheries habitats that we're dealing with and how ultimately that translates to, to um, fish production or loss of fish production. And probably everybody's very familiar with the effects of urbanization. There's tons of studies out there that have looked at this, mostly in streams, um, but also in the, in the bay and tidal waters proper. Um, you're very familiar, I'm sure, with the nutrient contaminant influences or increases in those sediments, increases in sediments that, um, that are, are, are tendent to increases in pervious surface changes in water supply and also flows and I think this slide really demonstrates some of the things that you all deal with maybe not hopefully not on a daily basis but maybe more frequently now than ever um, you know trying to manage how the water's flowing off the land um, in addition to what's in that water and how it's affecting the aquatic environment um, maybe probably more recently there's more information about how um, you know how impervious surface affects organic matter and um, food web dynamics and um, what we're looking at because we're um, our, our funding is specific to recreational fisheries we look at how um, changes in habitat are affecting some of these popular commercial or recreational and commercial species game, game fish um, you know and what Particularly, what we're we're looking at, and I'll focus a lot on today, is shad and herring. And if you all have have traced the the uh, management of shad and herring, you know it's um, shad and herring are declining coast wide, and there's been a very aggressive management, fisheries management, to the fact um, to the point where in Maryland there's a moratorium. Is it coast wide now? I think it might be coast wide now. Um, so. And why are we concerned about looking at impervious cover and how it's affecting fisheries? Well, Maryland's, um, Maryland and the East Coast, the Chesapeake Bay region, um, you know, we're, get, we're growing. This is, a, I think, 2010 um, estimate of impervious cover. And you see that, you know, there's a lot of red area, a lot of high impervious cover around the Baltimore Annapolis DC corridor. Um, that's projected to increase. Um, not just in in this region, but you all probably have better handle on where it's increasing in your in your neck of the woods. But you know we're we're going to expect to see this red kind of glow even further out um, as as we move toward twenty well gosh gosh 2030, 2040 now. So um, you know something to keep our eye on. Now what I want to show you is um, we've done numerous studies over the last fifteen years and focusing on. Um, early life stages of, of these key species that we're, we've been looking at, but also um, the, the later juvenile and adult life stages. And um, the early life stages, we do sampling in the spring, and then um, the, the later life stages in summer. 
And this map pretty much shows that all the areas we've sampled, we've been to a number of the watersheds in the Chesapeake and have data on a lot of spots, um, you know, and, and our, our work covers tidal fresh, the um, low salinity waters as well as the high salinity waters. So I'm going to launch into, hmm, there we go, um, our summer sampling. Our summer sampling we do um, July through September. We sample um, the higher salinity habitats with seining and trawling, um, go out twice a month. And, and this survey was started, oh, a number of years ago, really um, it, um, with the purpose of trying to assess what is the fish community like look like in these areas and are there differences among watersheds um, and and if there are what is predicting those differences and we had um, kind of a hypothesis that land development was um, a stressor that could predict differences that we might see in these fish communities so one of the things that we've found and documented over time is, um, is as impervious cover, which we use as a measure of development intensity, is that as that increases, your oxygen in your higher salinity areas declines. Um, now, what's, what's, this may not be a surprise to anyone, um, especially lately as this information has gotten broader, um, um, greater broadcast, but what, what we've seen, in, um, especially in some of these higher impervious cover areas, is not only do you get these more frequent low oxygen events, but you actually, your oxygen declines as you move up river. So your shallower waters actually have poorer oxygen content in the summertime than your deeper waters. And um, we did some work a case study, I think, in 2005, 2006 on the Severn River right outside of Annapolis, which is a high impervious river. And we did all kinds of water quality sampling at all depths of water. And, um, and I, over a couple months in the summertime, and what we found is um, in the Severn River, we did a frequency distribution of the oxygen by depth and basically found that um, it wasn't until you were in a meter of water that you were able to get oxygen conditions that were suitable for fish or um, constantly, you know, consistently suitable. So five milligrams per liter of oxygen in the, in, in, you know, one meter of water. So what that says to us is that, um, you know, as, as we see an increase in development in these watersheds, we're losing habitat. Fish are being squeezed into those shallower areas. Now, if you're an angler and you like white perch, um, when it gets really hot, you know if you go shore fishing around structure, you're going to be more likely to catch more white perch. Um, but what that means from a biology point of view is that these fish are being crowded into areas. Um, you know, and then when you, when you think about what Bill presented in terms of your, your hard structure causing um, a change in that near shore depth, you know, you kind of wonder what does that mean in terms of what uh, what is available in for fish um, in the summertime, particularly. Now, another issue that um, that I guess came to my awareness um, working with a, a citizen group in the Severn River, um, they wanted to know, you know, what can we do? What can we do? And they were worried about some of their um, near shore habitat. Um, and especially in terms of fishing. And so we had talked a little bit about this, but then as I was talking more and out with them during a summer camp, it, it hit me that a lot of the, a lot of those, these um, summer communities are really using their near shore areas. And so we had some discussion about, um, you know, they wanted to do stormwater to address the oxygen, stormwater management to address the oxygen. And I was like, well, you know, that, that's, that's great, but you know this stormwater management really is affecting your beach swimming area. And so the more you can do to reduce what's ever coming off the land and maybe potentially causing a challenge for your children, you know, in terms of safety, that's a, an, another um, you know a, another good thing to think about and to look into. So um, anyway, when we looked at at these areas with low oxygen, it wasn't a surprise to see that we are also seeing a decline. In um, white perch and striped bass, two very popular game fish, um, they need oxygen, you know, to live, and so you know, it wasn't a surprise to see this response. Um, but like I said, you know, these areas you're seeing a decline in use of the offshore area, but um, you know, habitat's pretty limited, and so there's a lot of crowding, a lot of loss in um, opportunity, loss in um, habitat, loss in fishing opportunity. So. 
Now, um, we also have looked at spawning habitat surveys, and, and um, we had the luxury, I guess is the luxury, of having historical information about um, spawning habitat all throughout Maryland. There were studies done in the late 60s and early 70s um, where they, um, they cat or, or, uh, mapped all the spawning habitat for um, migratory species in Maryland. And um, initially, what we, we, we engaged some citizen scientists to go out and try to ideally redo that whole entire study. Well, it was more than we could, could, um, could manage because we didn't have the staff to coordinate volunteer. And um, I can't remember who said, but you need pretty much need a staff, at least one staff member. Um, but we were able to launch a couple studies in a couple watersheds. Um, and that, that effort actually led us to look more and um, more intently in, into what was going on in these spawning habitats, and especially with these uh, um, key anadromous species. And so we sent volunteers out, and we had some state help as well to go around to different places and repeat <coughs> um, the historical uh, historical studies. And again, what we found is that um, as impervious surface increases the spawning ha habitat occupation declines. Um, the number of samples with egg and larvae decline. And this is very pronounced when we look at herring. Um, herring are more stream dependent than the other species that we were looking at. And, um, you know, and so this is, this is a little bit disconcerting given that, um, you know, we're seeing this decline coastwide. And um, there's a lot of discussion about what that is. And there's a lot of bycatch issues, things like that. But we're also showing that there's a habitat loss that could be contributing to that as well. <clears throat> so one of the things that we um, uh, the we saw in the historical data, we were looking at um, some stuff we had from the Bush River. I had some old water quality records, and when I looked at it compared to what we were seeing, what we were collecting um, a couple years ago, I noticed that conductivities historically were pretty low. Um, what we, what I think I would consider background or ambient. And when I, when we were looking at the recent data, we saw a, a big change. Um, so 70 microsiemens per centimeter compared to what we're seeing in our more recent stuff, anywhere from 150 to 200. So that was almost like a double in conductivity. And so um, it, um, at that time, there was some work being done in streams as well. And so we started to look at this. Um, we had a group in the Mattawaman Creek who were very invested in doing a lot of monitoring. And they kind of jumped on board, and they started doing a lot of uh, monitoring themselves. Now, um, you all probably know a lot about conductivity. It's simply a measure of electrical conductance in the water. Um, <clears throat> and, and there's a natural background, natural background level of conductivity, natural salts. But in urban systems, as we're finding out more and more, um, there's a lot more salt. The initial culprit was um, road salting, which, you know, if there's a lot of information coastwide or um, I guess up and down the, the seaboard about road salting. But um, more recent work has identified um, weathering of cements in urban environments as a source. Of course, there's um, sewage pollution and then fertilizers, too, that can contribute to salts. Um, <clears throat> but what we, um, we looked at this, we looked at this in Mattawam, and I apologize, I didn't throw the slide in here, but we did find an increase over time in Mattawam Creek. But um, more recently, we've been concerned with, um, with the Patuxent River um, you know, because this is a um, historical herring shad spawning area, and more recently, I guess in about a decade ago, or le less than half a decade ago, um, we started restocking herring and shad in this area. And so, um, I guess what was a year ago, Jim, we started looking at con I don't even know why we started, but we started looking at conductivity and pulled um, data from the Bay Program and other sources that we had and um, kind of um, looked at what was going on. Now, we also saw an increase in pervious cover from 78 to 2014, um, pretty significant rise in impervious cover. And I just want to um, point out that the four sites that we, we had a lot, a good continuous record on were Unity, Rocky Gorge, which are in the upper watershed, which is less urbanized, more rural. And then um, this tidal site down here, and I think Bowie, um, a, a water quality site at Bowie. And what we saw is over, over the period of record, you see an increase in conductivity in both of these areas. But um, this, this area in particular is where we find 
um, where the the spawning habitat habitat is for um, herring and shad, and um, you know this is represents a pretty significant increase in conductivity in that spawning habitat. And incidentally, um, the um, the hatchery folks that were were doing all this work of restocking. Um, reported that they didn't have a, a, a lot of success. And, you know, it could be that there's a, a significant habitat issue that's limiting that success in stocking. Now, I, want to do, I do want to say that we're not sure if conductivity actually represents a stressor, but it does represent a change in habitat. Um, and, you know, and so um, what can we, whatever we can do to kind of address habitat change um, is probably likely going to be beneficial to fish and even um, beneficial to some of our restoration efforts. So, you know, this is this is just a, a small sampling of some of the work we've been doing. Um, re every time we look at impervious cover or um, as a measure of stressor, and we look at it in relation to fish, we see a response. And so, we've been able to take this information and um, translate it into management a management narrative. And so, um, and and um, if. If Scott Stranko were here, I would have the 2% impervious cover as well, because that's the brook trout. But we're looking at from a tidal side, and so these are the management recommendations that um, come from a tidal fishery side. But um, we're looking at in terms of what we can do, what it means, and um, and how we manage fisheries, but also what it would mean in terms of managing the landscape. And so what we've found is that. Um, when we're in a situation where you have less than 5% impervious cover, we can manage fisheries with our, tip, our traditional techniques, which is usually to li limit harvest and stock if there's a need. Um, and then and from a landscape side, these are rural areas. And so the, the best management approach for, in terms of maintaining fisheries is to conserve those landscapes in that characteristic. And then restores, I mean, there's places on the shore that certainly could um, benefit from reconnection of marshes and things like that. So restoration in those areas is, would be um, you know, beneficial as well. Um, in watersheds where you have 5 to 10% impervious cover, um, we can decrease harvest. We can put stronger harvest limits on, um, on fisheries. And we can stock more aggressively to compensate for the losses that, um, that are habitat driven. In those areas, um, from a landscape perspective, we again recommend conservation and rehabilitating the watershed where you have an opportunity. And then in places where there's greater than 10% impervious surface, um, one case study we did basically suggests that our management toolbox doesn't work anymore in terms of fisheries. That limiting harvest um, does nothing to help or enhance, and stocking does nothing to help or enhance the fishery. And there is one case where, um, in a in a very urbanized setting, where we just went ahead and lifted any kind of fishing reg in terms of a ban and allowed um, recreational fishermen to go ahead and fish because there was nothing we could do to to man to really effectively manage that stock. However that fishery was being restocked outside of the watershed. It was, be, it was limited because of what was going on in the watershed, but there was natural restocking from outside the watershed, if that makes sense. Um, in those situations, what we, what we suggest is re-engineering the habitat where possible. And in those places, you're um, really trying to address um, you know, some of the infrastructure issues, but also nutrient sediment um, conditions, because you're still what you're still concerned or we're still concerned for some of that downstream habitat, receiving habitat. We want to address nutrient and sediment wherever we can. So um, we've translated that information and mapped it too. And I realized that um, just like um, about 10 minutes ago that I had a different map in here. Um, I wanted to put a different map in here, but this map can um, kind of guide where those narrative management um, strategies could be applied successfully, um, you know, and, and we do have more mapping tools available online for you all, um, not just from a fisheries perspective, but DNR has a, a whole, and I think, I don't know, most, a lot of people said DNR was a good source. I'm hoping the mapping tools were what you all were talking about because there was a lot of investment in those. Um, so. So um, what, what we want to do, what we continue to want to do is engage our constituents. We want to um, continue to pr promote um, to our fisheries managers this kind of information to begin to continue and, and uh, I guess more aggressively incorporate some of these habitat limitations 
into stock management, stock assessments. Um, we also want to continue to try to engage citizenry. Not, um, we, we can, we'd love to have citizen scientists join us because they do feed us data. But more importantly, they get educated in the process and they become constituents on the ground that can help, um, help you all. Um, you know, really promote sound management, sound approaches. And then um, with local government, as, as Helen said, we want to provide tools and information and data and even science stories that could help you communicate to your constituents why, you know, why you're, you're promoting conservation or uh, various management practices in your landscape. So. Yeah. So clearly the environment surfaces as the salt story tells is in some ways a surrogate. Right? So it's a surrogate measure, it's a correlation, but probably not directly a causation. What other things do you think are going on? Well, you know, um, that's a great question. And um, it, I wish we could answer it. Um, Can you the oh, I'm sorry. Um, in, the question was impervious surface is a surrogate for stressors. And um, you know what else is going on? Um, you know one of the things we we don't know. One one um, case study that we've been working on is um, we've been looking at yellow perch and yellow perch changes and yellow perch declines in urban areas. And um, you know we don't know. We suspect that it could be contaminants. There are some studies from other regions in in the nation that have associated um, road contaminants with. Um, spawning, you know, loss of spawning and, and responses. And so, you know, the, I guess the answer is we don't know, but, you know, there are a couple um, culprits we suspect are acting. Um, and we'd love to have the studies done, um, you know, to really identify that because the more, the more we can know, the better we can um, address it from a management perspective. I think Jim wants the pipe in. <laughs> All I was going to say is impervious surface is an, indica is, is an indicator of cumulative stress. So we had the list at the beginning, and it's just all those things are getting Amplified. piled in, and they're acting, probably acting synergistically, et cetera, and it just, so it's kind of a cascade. It's not one thing, it's everything. All right, thanks, Margaret. Thank you. <coughs>